<laughs> <laughs> Depends on if I have a good read. So. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right, cool. So, hello. <laughs> hello. Right, so I'll just give you a quick introduction. Um, hello, Opal Files. We are here today with Alyssa Morris, who is the professor at Kansas State University and a international performer and composer. And thank you so much for being with us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, we just wanted to kind of get to know you a little bit. I know that you're working on a lot of projects uh, coming up this year, including one big one in Houston with uh, ROCO, that's the River Oaks Chamber Orchestra. But before we talk more about that, uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you got started playing the oboe and how your career has kind of developed from the beginning till now? Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, I started piano first, actually, when I was five and, and uh, we had an old piano in our living room and um, I gravitated toward it, just wanting to pick out little melodies, Mary Had a Little Lamb, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and started begging my parents to um, get me piano lessons. And they said, well, will you practice every day? And I said, I promise I will. And so um, they, uh, when we moved to Utah, we, I actually was born in Texas. I was born in Fort Worth and lived there for about five years before we moved to Utah. And so when we moved to Utah, when I was five, um, they signed me up for piano lessons and I just loved it right away. I, um, liked to see if I could go a little bit further. I like to surprise the teacher and see if I could go a little bit further in the book than she told me to. And so one week I tried to kind of learn like 10 different of those little songs in the Bastion Primer book. And I don't remember if I learned them right, but anyway, it just, I, I loved it from the very beginning. And, and um, I also continued to love to pick out melodies on my own on the piano and, and start to improvise. And um, my parents kind of had to um, be vigilant that I was making sure to practice my assigned practice rather than oh. making sure that I knew that if you practice your whole time, if you practice all of your music in the beginning, then maybe the last this many minutes can be used for just your improvisation and, and making up stuff and having some fun on your own. And so that felt like the treat at the end. I mean, it was all a treat. I'm learning any wonderful repertoire is a treat, but, um, but it felt like the, the little kind of the thing that I was looking most forward to was just having some freedom to make up some of my own melodies. And I started writing more, I guess, not concrete, but, you know, pieces that, that had structure, a beginning, middle, and end. And I was trying to write them out on paper when I was in fourth grade. And but I didn't really know song, I guess, or piece that I, that I, when I played it again and again on the piano, it basically was sounding the same. And in hindsight, I, I look back and, and realize, oh, it was in rondo form. Like I, I was kind of hearing that from some of the other music that I was, that I was playing. And so it, I wouldn't have known to call it that then, but it just kind of sometimes music gravitates toward that because of what we have learned up to that point. So it was my first little rondo form piece and I wanted to enter it in this competition that we have at through the schools, the public schools called the Reflections Competition. And my parents um, found a, a, a recording engineer in the area who could uh, transcribe for me and, and put it into a software system so that I could, but, um, because I took my best stab at, you know, trying to put it on paper, but I was still learning you know I, I think I was I was still I a little bit later maybe two years later when I started doing those things uh, those competitions some more I started writing out the notation myself but I need a little bit of help this first time and so and so I was that that experience of going into the studio and and having my music transcribed was really um uh had an impact on me and I was very excited about it and and grateful for my parents support and um They've always been so supportive of all of that. And, um, and the piece uh, had great success for considering, you know, for a fourth grader, I guess, you know, <laughs> and, and, I, and I went on to the district and the region and the state level competition. And I was really excited about that. And it kind of um, made me thirst and, 
And of course, as a fourth grader, when you get a little trophy, you're like, oh, I really want to do that again. But <laughs> I mean, now I realize, you know, as an adult that it was about so much more than the award, but got excited about feeling successful, you know, and, and, and just having the experience of making beautiful music. And, um, so anyway, uh, I did it again about every year. I started entering this competition and, and trying to push myself a little bit further. I started doing piano duos and, and I started writing, um, when I was in middle school, I started writing for like, I, I think I had one for vocal and piano and flute that uh, went on to the state level and, and was awarded, uh, received an award at state. And, and then when I was in um, high school, I, I wrote um, a band piece that also received recognition at state. And, and, um, and so I just, I really enjoyed kind of making that be a yearly goal to write a piece for this competition. And, and learned a lot from it. I started, um, I guess I should go back to when I started the oboe too, because that really, I think, had an impact on on the direction of my writing. Just being in band had a direction of, an impact on the direction of my writing and and what I was doing. Um, so I continued to take piano lessons. And then in seventh grade, just before seventh grade, I was deciding which instrument I would play in band. That's when we started in Utah. And I um, thought I wanted to play the clarinet or the flute and uh, my band teacher said well have you thought about the oboe and I didn't even know what it was I said what's the oboe and so he showed me you know this old Linton oboe that <laughs> that had the B and the B flat sounded the same because it really needed repair and luckily he was able to get a, a great fox uh, that he that the school purchased the next year so it was so by year two I was Playing a really wonderful instrument, and then year one took a little bit of, of patience on the, the you know well loved oboe, but um, but I I learned a lot and I loved it from the beginning and and I thought the sound was really unique. I kind of liked that there weren't very many of us, but also but kind of I mean considering just being at a middle school, there were I guess a few of us. There were four oboes that year that started oboe. And, and, um, but we all had a lot of fun and, and I loved it from the beginning and I love the camaraderie of band. I love being in band and, um, I love for my students to experience band because I think that you really make, yeah, I just loved the camaraderie of band and I love for my students to experience that too. I love for them to be in band and learn to work together with other people who play so many different instruments in band and learn from them and learn from their wonderful band director. So I am way love band. Um, and uh, so anyway, I continued to uh, take oboe lessons and take piano lessons. And I started taking composition lessons also when I was in high school. Um, just um, uh, tried to do whatever I could to, I, I kind of was divided, I guess. I, I really loved playing piano. I really loved playing oboe. I really loved composing. I didn't know, I knew I wanted to go into music when I went into college, but I didn't know which direction I wanted to go. Um, because I just wanted to keep doing all of it. You know, I thought I would feel like there would be a musical hole in my heart if I had to give any one of them up. And, uh, so when I was, preparing to audition. I prepared, I, I took auditions in, for college on piano and, and on oboe. And then later you declare, at least at these schools, later you would declare whether you were a performance or composition major. And so I could start taking composition lessons, whether I was a pianist or whether I was studying piano or studying oboe. And so I, um, at the schools I auditioned to, I received scholarships on, in oboe um, and was on waiting list in piano. And so that kind of made the decision a little bit easier, but I still, um, I feel like it was the perfect direction because I still had the opportunity to play piano a lot. I had, there were a lot of my friends in the oboe studio who needed people to play piano for them for when they performed in master class or for their recitals. And, and so that still challenged me and I was able to do a lot of that. And I still use it all of the time when I teach music theory and dictation. And when I help my students with 
um, their oboe repertoire. I play on the piano for them a lot. And so with them and collaborate with them. And, and so I, I feel like it was the, the perfect direction. And, and, um, and I loved the camaraderie of the oboe studio right away. I, I did my undergraduate at Brigham Young University studying with Geraldine Giovanetti and she was a wonderful nurturing teacher and so supportive. And, and she knew that I really was interested in composition as, as well and, and was undecided as to whether I was going to go the performance route or composition route, but wanted to somehow do both. And, um, and so, um, I continued to take composition classes. I ultimately did decide that I did, I was going to do a performance major, but continued to take composition classes all along while I was at BYU and, and in my master's degree and in my doctorate and, and kind of um, enough that it would have been a minor or another major. I just, I just wanted to take all of the classes that I could and in counterpoint and orchestration and, um, and songwriting and in fact I, I really feel like these classes um still impact me today um i uh, just recently put together a songwriting class that i will be offering at k-state next semester and um i created the class um because i loved my experience in songwriting class so much when i was at byu i took i really enjoyed um being in songwriting at Brigham Young University and um, I took three classes and private lessons and so I decided here at K-State I would love to offer that class and so next semester will be my first semester offering it. I'm really excited. Cool. Um, so I continued to um, I continued to take uh, composition classes while I was at BYU and study performance and and as I was preparing for my um, undergraduate senior recital, I asked uh, my teacher, Gerilyn, what she would think about me writing a piece that I would play at my senior recital, if she would be all right with that. And she was very supportive and said, absolutely, that would be great. And, and so I started to work on the piece. Um, and this is the, um, I showed her the piece and uh, when I kind of had had the piece finished um, I played it for her brother my accompanist and, and we performed it and after we performed it she was very encouraging of it she was um, very positive about it and and she said you know you might consider um, seeing what uh, Trevor Kramer thought about the piece if if he might consider publishing it and she said and maybe you know what would be great is if you could get somebody to perform it at, you know, maybe in a more international venue or so that more people can hear it. She says, why don't you send it to um, Dr. King at University of Michigan. Dr. King loves to perform new music and does so, so beautifully well. And, and so um, uh, this was, you know, a little out of my comfort zone as a, a college senior, but I, all I had thought of was just, I was, I was going to write this piece. I was going to play it at my senior recital and, and I didn't really have any, you know, further vision besides that. <laughs> and she was so great all of the time to help me see that there's more that you can do and that you should do and, and push yourself. And, and I remember her saying sometimes, you know, um, it, she said something to the effect of, when you ask the question, what's the worst thing that they can say? They can say no. And she says, usually I find that if I ask that I get it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was not really always the case. We ask for things that we don't get. But the point was that if you don't ask, you don't get anything. Right. Or if you don't try, you don't get anything. But if you try, the worst thing that could happen is that somebody says no and then you just go and you try again you know um and so uh, the music to trevor he was very supportive and and he uh and he said he wanted to publish the piece which i was thrilled about and when i sent it to dr king she said i love the piece and i would love to play it at idrs in 2008 which was at brigham young in University. And so, oh my goodness, just so excited. I had no idea that all of that could come from just 
you know, asking and, and, <laughs> and trying and, and, um, it, Geraldine, uh, changed my thinking that way and challenged me to think harder about how I might, what I might do next with a piece that I wrote or, or with a thing that I was doing in, you know, in music or, or trying to promote. You're doing that with your wonderful YouTube uh, channel right here. I mean, every, all the time you're, you're putting out such wonderful material and, and probably thinking to yourself, what more can I do? How, how can I helping the lives of so many oboists and, and helping them to learn and, and um, connecting double read worlds. So it's great. Um, Thanks. So because of the, I mean, I really feel like that launched my compositional direction and I started receiving commissions slowly at first, but I started receiving commissions for um, projects. My first commission that I finished was in 2009. That was about a year after IDRS in 2008. And it was for a doctoral student at Arizona State. And it's a piece for oboe and four percussionists called Forecast. And, and it's a piece that I'm in the process of recording for my next album. I'd wanted to for a while, but I, you know, I now is a really good time. Well, I guess now is not because we have to get <laughs> we have to regroup and gather and once we we're safe to do so to do the last movement we recorded the first three movements so we still need to record the last movement so wow but anyway um but uh and then my second commission was just after that and it was uh martin Schering uh commissioned me uh, at arizona state for his faculty woodwind quartet to to write a piece for his a faculty woodwind quartet so that piece is called motion and it's for flute oboe clarinet and bassoon and so i feel really grateful to these first two commissioners for you know kind of putting their faith in a, a young composer who was very much the beginning of all of this and and um and then gradually i started receiving more commissions for oboe and oboe chamber ensembles and then it starts within the last couple of years or so it started to branch out a little bit more as I took on kind of a little bit more challenging I guess um or new projects when I um I had was commissioned to write the oboe concerto in 2014 I think is when it was premiered and then after that I when I was in the Richmond Symphony Orchestra, when I was studying at CCM, um, I played in the Richmond Symphony Orchestra and one of the orchestra members who was on the board found out that I composed and, and he asked if I had any samples that I could send them. And so I sent them a variety a band piece that I had written a couple of years back when I was studying orchestration in my master's degree at BYU and, and uh, the concerto and then some smaller ensemble works, but I wanted to be able to show them some larger ensemble works just so they could get an idea of the orchestration since they would be if they were considering they would be commissioning for something that was um that was for the orchestra and so and so i sent them the samples and then um a, a few months later the conductor said we'd like to commission you to write an orchestra piece which was my first orchestra commission and I was thrilled about it and it was after I had or it was just as I was moving to um Kansas State to take my job at K-State and so um I I wrote the piece in 2018 and it was premiered just last year in 2019 and um it's called Changing Faces and it was my first orchestra work and but again I feel like that those words that Gerilyn said regarding you know what what next just kind of challenging my thinking of what next kind of um were in my head when we had a conversation after the the premiere of the concert uh of the the concert the piece premiere sorry um and I, I was talking to the conductor and I was talking to the cello um the cellist who is the soloist then and um uh, Andres Diaz and we were all conversing um, together with the board after the concert and um, Andres Diaz said um, he was talking to me about my piece he had played the Schumann cello concerto that night on the program also and and he was talking to me about my piece and he said no you should write something for cello it'd be great to have a cello concerto and I thought, oh my goodness that would be so great because I, I I love writing for oboe and I still feel like there's 
there's so much more to say on the oboe and I, it will always be my, you know, where my heart is, I think, because, because that's what I play and, <laughs> and where I feel like I grew and learned as a musician, but the opportunity to learn other instruments and their capabilities and, and um, be able to say something musically um, in other instrumentation is, is so exciting. And so, and so I said, well, and, and the conductor, Guy Bordeaux, he, when Andres Diaz said it would be great to have something for cello, Guy said, wow, we should really make that happen. And I was like, oh, how could I do that? And I knew about this, um, uh, this competition, uh, the Barlow um, competition, and um, it's a, a commissioning competition or a commissioning grant I guess that you can apply for as a composer if you have a group and you have a you have musicians who have agreed or want to play your work and and so you can present your project to the Barlow Endowment um, to for this the, to be considered for this commission and so I put together a proposal for um, a cello concerto that the Richmond Symphony would premiere with Andres Diaz as soloist and and found out last summer that um, the project was um, accepted and that uh, it would be funded. And so I was thrilled about receiving a Barlow commission. And and um, and so that's one of the projects that I'm working on right now, actually. Um, I was working on it last night, this okay. concerto for Andres Diaz and the Richmond Symphony. So um, that's been a new um challenge right now and and i am grateful for these kind of different directions compositionally that i've been able to go because it's opened doors for this you've mentioned the river oaks chamber orchestra the wonderful opportunity that i feel like it is going to be to and it already has been to work with roco they're a fantastic organization that um it really um i think one of their missions is new music is to commission composers and um, living composers. And, and so I feel really honored to be able to work with them. They've worked with so many fantastic composers. Um, so I feel again, lucky that they're putting their trust in me this season. And, and, um, and so uh, a couple of years ago, Alicia lawyer, who is the she's the head of roco and and she's an, the oboist too and and uh she came forward came to me in an email asking about commissioning a work for oboe and clarinet and bassoon at an instrumentation i hadn't yet written in and um and so this was 2017 i think and or yeah um, i think i wrote it the summer of 2017 right before i started at k-state that's right and um and so i was thrilled at being able to write for her and for her those wonderful musicians at roco and and uh she liked the idea of knickknack because her um, initials alicia and the initials of the clarinetist nathan and of uh, kristen um k and a k spelled knack and so they thought it would be fun to write a piece about knickknacks and i had no idea what direction i would go <laughs> Um, I was thinking of the curio cabinet. How was I going to depict all these things? And I, I don't know. I don't have a curio cabinet. But um, so, so then I thought, well, there knickknacks are often made of different material. It might be neat to be able to depict the sound of these different materials. And so um, I uh, decided that each movement would be based on different materials that these knickknacks could be made of, glass or wood or metal. And so that meant that I kind of wanted to find a way that they could percussively um, include these in each movement. So in metal, uh, one of the instrumentalists plays the brush, like a brush stick on, um, on the stand and they play triangle. And so there are some other metal sounds there and, and wood. I have kind of the, the where they have a pedal that's connected to a wood block so they can play a rhythm on this kind of wood block while they're still playing oboe or um uh they're also playing wood block with sticks and then in glass i have them tuned bottles actually they've got a whole bunch of bottles that they tune to different pitches and um kind of play those pitches as as another instrumentalist plays kind of a cadential like figure so, so 
Can I ask you anyway, a question about that? Yeah, absolutely. The players of the trio are playing the percussion instruments. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because okay. when I heard the recording, I thought there was a fourth player playing the. No. Oh, interesting. No, okay. they're all playing it at the same time. So, um, so, um, so the, I think the hardest part personally, um, is the part where the oboist plays the oboe and has to do the foot pedal at the same time. <laughs> oh, and, okay. um, that's probably the trickiest part, but usually what's happening is two people will be playing and somebody else is playing in, in the rest different percussion instrument. There are a couple of quick changes or, you know, the bassoonist has to quickly grab something and, you know, um, but mostly you don't have to do it at the same time time as you're playing because two people will be playing while another person is <clears throat> playing the percussion but occasionally it happens at the same time in that okay. sense some of its own unique challenges it's kind of like kind of like this you know like rub your tummy yeah. your head. <laughs> <laughs> and cross your eyes at the same time or something you know so but they did a fantastic job they were so great and they made a really beautiful recording of it and um and so after that um alicia talked to me about the possibility of writing something else for Roko, this, um, this solo, for, this kind of concerto for their willowist, flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, and their chamber orchestra. And so initially, um, that was the piece that we were planning on, which is still the piece that we're planning on. But then later she asked, what would you think about being the composer in residence and then writing two more pieces for um, us during that season? And so I'm so thrilled to be able to um, be their composer in residence and, and be able to do that. Um, and the other two pieces that I will be writing, one is a uh, sextet for wind quintet piano, which I've always been really wanting to write. And, um, and then another is for oboe and uh, percussion, just a duo, uh, one percussionist and an oboist. So cool. And the oboe may play some percussion, but, um, and the percussion the, may play some oboe. But the percussion will play some percussion. Yeah, I don't know. The percussion probably won't play some oboe. Maybe they can play a reed. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. So well, anyway, and yeah. um, I'm trying to think if there was anything I forgot. I just gave you a mouthful of information. But um, yeah, I I really love my job at K-State. I love teaching the oboists at K-State. They are wonderful, good people and hard workers. And um and uh, I also love that I get to teach them and I get to teach music theory. So I get to know a lot of the students in the school um, and they're, it's a really tight knit community of, of students who are hard workers and so kind. And, and so it's a, I, I feel like being the oboe professor there is, is like my dream job because not only do I get to make beautiful music with my colleagues in the quintet, and some of my colleagues are in the Topeka Symphony with me also, so we get to go and travel and, and do that together and um, and work with the wonderful oboe students there. Um, but I also get to work with the students in music theory, and because part of our job is research that's pretty open-ended, I can I can some of my research is writing the music that I do, and and some of it is recording the music, and some of it is performing with the Pika Symphony, and some of it is is there's a variety of different things that it can be, and so looking back to you know 18 year old me wondering how I was going to keep all of these different um, important aspects of music in my life, teaching and, and performing and composing. And, and I feel like this job is, is perfect for that. And I couldn't have hoped for it to balance it in this way any better. I love that I'm still able to do all of those things. So, yeah. Wow. Great. Well, okay. So real fast, just to debrief everybody who, who listened to this incredible journey. Uh, the River Oaks Chamber Orchestra is based in Houston. And uh, there'll be a link in the description for the, their upcoming season, which will feature uh, you as their resident composer. Uh, what else we have? Oh, the Richardson Orchestra is in Indiana. So Richmond, yep, Richmond, Richmond Symphony. And no, that's totally OK. Richmond Symphony in Richmond, Indiana. Mm -hmm. in Indiana. And we'll have a link to their season as well. And the solo, awesome. uh, Mr. Diaz, is a professor at Southern Methodist University. Yes. And so we'll yeah. have a link to his information as well. <laughs> so any information that you're looking awesome. for is definitely in the description. Uh, 
Cool. As, did I forget anything? Oh, uh, your your compositions, your your commissions. Uh, most of them can be found on YouTube. So a lot of people have already recorded them. So that's pretty but cool. But I am behind on updating my website. That's hopefully a project I can get to this summer, depending on how, depending. I always say right. that's going to happen, but it seems like the website gets put on the back burner as I take on a new composition project and, or yeah. dive into that. And so, and so my website is woefully out of date. So I'm sorry about that. Okay. Well, well, <laughs> but the but links some to of it. the information you can find on the website. Some okay. And on like K-State's website too, you can find my information on K-State's website um, and a link to the Oboe Studio and for any questions about that too. So, yeah. Wow, yeah, there's just a lot, there's a lot happening for you right now, it's awesome. So we just want people to be able to get to, get to see it, <laughs> get to know about it. Well, that's so nice of you, I appreciate it. Um, wow, that was really cool. I have uh, so many questions for you about, um, cause, I, I, it seems like you see yourself largely as a composer. Um, and then in addition to your oboe career as maybe something that kind of Venn diagrams in the middle. Yeah, I, I think the Venn diagram is a, <laughs> so when I feel like, I don't know if you've experienced this before when you were, when you were in a performance or doing something musically and you're like, Oh my goodness, I feel like I'm having my moment. Like this is this is where I feel like all of the things that I'm interested in and, and most care about in music meet together and I'm like you have that kind of aha moment, you know? Yeah. So when I so this past season with the Topeka Symphony, I performed my concerto Dreamscape with the Topeka Symphony. And that was a moment where I had like this aha, you know, kind of artist moment when I felt like I was, um, it was a, the most genuine musical offering, I guess I could give because I felt like it, it merged all of the things that musically I most, you know, was interested in and, and was trying to offer together in a, in a performance where I was able to perform my own interpretation of my music and with my very wonderful supportive orchestra and conductor and, and uh, to an audience that I have grown to love here in Topeka and well not here in Topeka I'm in Manhattan but it's about an hour away the the Topeka audience and they're so wonderful and supportive and I just felt like I had that kind of musical aha moment then and and so um and then also in January I gave a recital um at K-State it was my you know yearly recital that I try to prepare for every year that I give at K-State and sometimes when I'm going on and touring, I'll give portions of that recital when I go to different universities or, um, or like kind of piece together parts of that recital with something else. Yeah. Anyway, um, this particular recital I was preparing because part of it would be for my IDRS recital that was going to be this summer, but you know, you know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> right. So anyone who's seeing this in the future, well, or... it happen, yeah. you know? but you know, we just hope that everybody's staying well and safe and everything. Right. So. Um, but, uh, so I was preparing a recital of music by female American, contemporary female American composers, and I included a couple of my works, partially because I was working toward my second, um, CD, um, and so two of the pieces would be on that CD, or will be on that CD, because I'll probably be recording it this summer or later this year when, when the place that I'm recording opens up for a little bit. So, um, uh, so I performed those pieces and I performed these other pieces together in this recital. And I had that, you know, like musical aha moment again, especially when I was playing one particular piece um, that I had just finished. It's um, titled 2772. Um, and it was, I wrote it um, actually, oh, was it two years ago now? It was premiered around the same time that the piece by the Richmond Symphony, was, that the Richmond Symphony uh, commissioned was premiered. So it was April, 2019 that it was premiered. And, um, and I, so I performed it and, um, and it was commissioned by a consortium of, of students that were, they were students at Baylor when Doris DeLoach was the professor there and they all wanted to kind of give a, a musical gift to her. And so they came together and, and commissioned this 
work for her. And it was a, a pleasure to learn more about her and then get to know her better when I came out for the premiere. She is so wonderful, just a delightful, wonderful, inspiring person. And, um, and uh, so I, when I was learning more about her and, and preparing this piece, I feel like the piece kind of not only spoke to like it was about her, but about teachers in, in general and about teaching and about the impact that a teacher can have on you. And so when I, I was kind of thinking about this when I was playing this piece and, and collaborating with my wonderful um, uh, pianist, Amanda Arrington, who I really miss performing with because that's just like pure magic getting to make music with her. Um, she's amazing and and so positive and optimistic and just makes you feel like a million bucks so um anyway uh uh i had that musical aha moment again i guess when we were playing that piece and so whenever i whenever i kind of have those moments i feel like i i see what has the most value to me in my musical career it's kind of highlights it and i feel like that's what the the thing that I guess I, I feel is most important for me to offer, you know, and I don't even know if it's about, I don't even know if it's more about the music or trying to share the message, you know, of mm -hmm. optimism and hope and trying to bring light to people's lives and, and having that sort of connection. Um, so I'm still learning that way, but I do feel like when those moments have happened, I feel like it's been an elevated connection more than just music, but it, but it conveying a, a message and having a musical connective moment with people in the audience where you're able to share a, kind of a message of hope, I guess, and, and light and goodness. So anyway, um, wow. yeah. Yeah, so I, speaking on this, do you teach any composition students as well? Yes, um, a, a little bit. Um, we have a fantastic composition professor at K-State. He's fabulous. His name is Craig Weston, and he's a great friend of mine, and I love his compositions. I, I love his work, um, and he is such a fantastic teacher of the students in his composition studio, and as his studio has grown, um, there was an opportunity this past year for me to take on one of the composition students and wow. so I worked with this student for the past year and this next semester um, Dr. Weston will be on sabbatical and so I will be teaching all of his composition students oh, this wow. next semester and so yeah I'm really excited at the opportunity of working with these wonderful students some of which I've gotten to know really well and in music theory class and in music theory class actually we have the opportunity to teach composition because each of our theory core classes the end uh, uh, project is a composition and so i teach theory three and so their end composition has to incorporate they have to be writing in one of the forms that we're learning whether it's sonata form or rondo or ternary or binary or um and they need to include a secondary function chord or possibly some little mixture and, and some, and, um, but it's also, so there, there are these like little pillars that they have to make sure they include, include these things, but outside of that, it could be anything they wanted it to be, you know, yeah. and, but these little things are just there to challenge them to, um, challenge them harmonically or to challenge them with their form to write something in a really, um, one of these really wonderfully cohesive forms. And so, um, and and so the students have been wonderful to work with and they've written some really neat uh compositions in these classes so i'll be looking forward to working with some of these students who yeah. were in those classes in this my, next semester when i teach them so yeah. my favorite thing about uh theory class when i was going through undergrad was the end of the year compositions like, and i think yeah. my favorite one was uh, we had a tango assignment uh at the end of our third semester was like the funnest time in theory I ever had. It was tango? Yeah, we all had to write a tango. That's it was super fun. That's awesome. <laughs> that's so great. Um, How fun. Yeah, it was awesome. So I wanted to ask you, because you do teach both composition and, well, the oboe to a great extent, what your teaching philosophy, you talked a little bit about your former teachers, uh, but how your teaching philosophy has changed in general, what it is and how it might change depending on oboe or composition or if it, is the same. Yeah. Um, so um, 
at K-State, we have, oh, such a wonderful variety of students with different um, musical directions. Um, we have uh, students who are preparing to be band directors themselves. I have a student who just barely found out that he got a job as band director um, and will be lucky for me, he'll only be like 20 or 30 minutes away. So that'll be really nice. Um, uh, and another student who she uh, graduated my, my first, the end of my first year there. And same thing, she went into music education as a wonderful um, music educator and, and is going to be taking a job now. She was in Hiawatha and is going to be in Garden City. And, and so um, she's done great work also. And, um, and then my graduate student who is preparing for um, doctoral programs and also other students. I have a student who's a double major in music and in, um, and in the medical field. I think her other major is life sciences. She wants to be a doctor. I think she's leaning towards like, what's the ENT where, you know, and she's really fascinated with what goes on in your ears and your mouth and that I think partially oboe could have something to do with that, you know, because Absolutely. there's a lot that's going on in there. <laughs> and, and so, and other students who will, a student who wants to be a dentist and a student who they all have these, dreams and aspirations and and music can help them along the way with all of their dreams it teaches you to be a hard worker it teaches you to ask questions um, and to search for creative answers and creative solutions um, I was really grateful for my teacher who recognized that um, that we each had unique kind of desires with regard to music when I came in I I wanted to be a performer and a composer and a, I still wanted to play piano and I wanted to teach and I didn't know how all of that was going to fit together and and she was so supportive and helped me to helped highlight the things that were unique about me and my musical journey and helped to direct me in those ways and and didn't box me into one way but made sure that I had all of the tools that I needed to be successful as an oboist and and a musician but but helped to, you know, like really let me to thrive in the direction that I wanted to go. And I feel really lucky that Dr. Ostoich at, um, Mark Ostoich at CCM did the same thing. He was so wonderfully supportive. When I was there, he commissioned a piece and we performed it at IDRS in 2016. And, and he was very, very supportive. And, and um, one of the things that I loved about the program there was that it was so, um, flexible regarding what your doctoral project could be. And so I asked him, well, could it be this piece that I'm working on? I was working on writing the collision etudes at the time. And, mm. and I was, um, uh, and he was very supportive of that. He's like, absolutely, that can be your project. And so that was my project. And then my recital was a kind of a side by side of the collision etudes and um, the Silvestrini etudes, which were definitely a an inspiration to the piece. And so I performed both of them and I talked at length about them and compared them to some music that was about art from the past, like pictures of an exhibition. And, mm. and, um, and I was just really grateful for Dr. O and his, he was really good at teaching us to ask questions and to, and to learn from everyone because everyone has so many unique things about their perspective or where they're coming from that they have to offer. And so for my students, I, I really like to make sure that I'm trying to pay attention to the things that are really important to them musically and the direction that they want to go and to help them with all of the things about the oboe that they need to learn, but to make sure that I'm paying attention to to the things that are really important to them and that make them unique as a musician and, and what they want out of music and so that I can help them to set goals there and and to be able to um and to be able to thrive in, in that way and, and find the things that, that that are really important to them musically and that they're in, um passionate about and to also ask questions. And so I guess one of my teaching philosophies is that I'm trying to each lesson to help them to come to the answer themselves rather than just giving it to them because it's so much better if if they figure out the answer i think they remember it more um than if they or than if they are just given the answer 
For example, phrasing. If you have a particular phrase, I've talked to students, when I talk to students about phrasing, sure, I could show them how I would phrase it, hmm. but is that really authentic? I mean, when we listen to three different recordings of the Sasa um, and hear that there are three different very beautiful ways to phrase it, is one more right than the other? And so I think it's really important to help them toward their answers and so that they can problem solve and 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 it teaches them later which is another thing that dr o was really passionate about is teaching us to become our own best teacher i think when they find their way through the problem solving process they can remember that in their practice later and then they can figure out how to seek out the answers to their questions and, and teach themselves in their practicing so those are a couple of thoughts, I guess, yeah, about my Yeah, those are great. Philosophy. Those are really important. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. So how has the composition process changed for you since you started out in fourth grade versus now that you're doing a lot of heavy hitting works? Um, well, I think there are some similarities because it seems like it all started with improvisation. Some composers start with, you know, pencil to paper right away or or just thinking about it in their mind. And I think that, I guess, as I've evolved, like each of those things, those ways has become part of my process also. But, um, but I, I uh, started with improvisation for sure when I was in fourth grade until I was kind of playing something predictably that I was playing the same way. And then once I was, I felt like I was ready to record it or, or put it on paper or something like that. And now I can't really do it that way if you're writing a full symphonic work or, or a concerto or whatever. I don't think I could memorize, you know, the 24 minutes of music that I'm supposed to write or whatever, you know. And so, um, so, and I, I feel like time is, it's tricky um, to find the right amount of time, big chunks of time where I can sit down and write because I have two young kids and, and, you know, a job and, and other things that we're doing. And so, um, and so I try to maximize the time that I do have credit. Sometimes when I'm speaking, it's um, branching out with regard to improvement, where I wasn't just improvising on the piano or on the oboe. I guess that that was when I was starting to write the um, the oboe and percussion piece, that was something that I started to try doing, was improvising on the oboe. And I did find that my the melodies and the figures that came up were a little bit different than what would happen if I was improvising on the piano. And it helps me to kind of, I, I don't know, spark some um, changes and, and differences in my compositional style if I did that. So I tried to start doing the same thing with voice because when I'm in the car, if I'm starting to kind of, piece together a melody in my head or hear a melody in my head. Um, I don't want to forget it. And, and so I just use the recording part of my phone. I just kind of hit record and I sing in this melody that I start to kind of piece together uh, or have improvised so I can come back to it later. And sometimes um, I think that as my, style has evolved it used to be that I would play the music I would I would I would improvise the music I'd make up the piece and then later I'd decide what it was about or what it was called and and it was just music and now I feel like it's a kind of a combination where sometimes I, I have a message that I want to share with the music or that the music is about something if it is about something and sometimes when a piece is commissioned they have something in particular that it, they want it to be about. I had a piece that I wrote not too long ago for a Reed Quintet that was about endangered animals. And I felt like I needed to learn a lot about those endangered animals that the commissioner wanted the piece to be about before so that it could inform my compositional process. So like if I learned about a region that they were from that I could possibly you know, try to depict music of that area if it was kind of built around pentatonic or something like that. Yeah. Or um maybe like one of the animals was the blue whale and so i wanted to try and include some depictions of whale call or whale song and okay. music and and so that kind of research happens in pieces here too um so that i can learn as much as i can 
about what I'm writing about before I, I write it. And so, um, and so, uh, it doesn't always happen either from start to finish anymore. I used to feel like I was writing a piece from start to finish, but now probably I will write a second movement and then I'll realize that it's the second movement later and then, mm. and then write the first movement or write kind of the main motive that connects through the whole piece, but it will come back again and again through the piece. And so I guess in those ways that it's changed, um, as I have, um, gone like studied more in school, I've realized the importance of research. And so I think that researching what I want the pieces to be about is, is a pretty important part of the process. Whereas when I was in fourth grade, I really didn't do much of that at all. You know, right. that wasn't necessarily a, something I even thought about as important for the piece, but I, but I feel like the research for the music can come in a bunch of different ways. Um, studying. So for a cello concerto, I'm, trying to do a lot of listening and score study of other concertos from like the ones that are uh, really pinnacles of their repertoire and also ones that are new um, that include some extended technique that maybe I didn't know that the cello could do. Um, and uh, other research, just pulling open an orchestration book and trying to learn what the range is or what, what's typical, you know, when they do double stops or what's typical for them. And, um, and then also researching, you know, if I wanted to include, uh, like little licks or riffs from a transcription or quotations or something like that, I feel like that involves a little bit of research too. Um, so, uh, the research part of it, I guess would be the most different part of what wow. I'm doing, what I've been doing maybe in the last eight years or so. so yeah, that's super interesting, especially after years. people going through that process of modulating their composition uh, maturity, I guess. Um, I know that you teach a lot, especially now that you have your, well, it's not a new job really anymore, but you know, your current job, you teach a lot of students and you mentioned that you had a practice technique that uh, would be cool to show off. Sure. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Let me just dunk my read here. Sure. Um, uh, do I need to get anything out? Or? Yeah, you can get, get an oboe out. That would okay. be super great. So and we can do this with music. We can do it with a scale. I mentioned the possibility of doing it with Mozart, but we can also do it with, you know, anything, which is a scale too. So I feel like um, repetition. I mean, we all know this, that repetition is a super important part of our, our learning process. We really just have to play some of those technical things over and over and over again in order to do this. And so this technique might not be new to some people, but hopefully it will be new to some people. Um, I was listening to um, one of my former professors. She teaches flute at Brigham Young University and she has a, I think she's, her YouTube channel is called Flute Tube and she started to post videos during this like time. Um, that are helpful practice techniques for students. And she taught, talked about her abacus. Is that what it's called? The thing that has the beads yeah. that you move over that has 100. And she, I knew that she had one of these in her office and I really want to get one for my office, but her, um, and I have played games, repetition games like this before, but never to this extreme. And I thought it was really inspiring. She said that when she was learning excerpts or working on any particular really hard riff in a piece, um, she would use the abacus and she'd move one over when she got it right and move another over when she got it right. And if she got it wrong, they all went back over. And so her goal was 100 times right in a row, oh, which wow. was like so admirable. You know, I'd done the penny game where I'd like taken 10 pennies and I moved a penny over when I got it right. And then I move it back over when I got, if I got it wrong or, or move the whole set over when I got it wrong. So, but to take it to the next level and do 100 was so inspiring. So I want to get an abacus to, you know, drive my students a little bit crazy, not really crazy, but, and I don't think you could get the full, I don't know, maybe if you had five hours in a row of practice or something like that. And I don't think you could mentally do one passage for five hours in a row. It might not be healthy, but, <laughs> <laughs> well. but um, you know, you could take it in chunks and wherever you got to up to that point, the abacus would allow you to leave it there, you know, and, and, and right. see your progress. And, and uh, so I just thought that was really admirable. So I was thinking about the different ways that we 
um, we repeat things though, because it's not always helpful just to play a scale. Uh, I'll play a couple notes first. <laughs> So it's not if you have a really hard scale, I'm not going to pick a hard scale, but say you just have a difficult scale and if you play it over and over, that might be helpful, but if, if, if you play it over and over and you're having the same mistake, and you make the same mistake over and over, then it's not necessarily helpful to repeat it over and over the same way. So um, I like to take my students through uneven rhythms um, in these passages. So would it more help do it? Oh yeah, one, some music did you have with you? Do you happen to have Mozart close? Oh no, sure, I have Mozart, music. but I think I have it. Do you, you wanna do the first movement somewhere? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, how about we do the, the first lick, the one that leads into the... We could do this part. Great. Okay, that great. Part right there. Uh -huh. So, first rhythm is long, short, long, short. So if you just take through, take those two measures maybe and just play long, short, long, short, that would be great. Yeah, exactly. And then whatever your metronome marking is at where you're playing that with, you gradually get faster until you're playing long, short, really fluently. Mm, okay. And then switch it to short, long, short, long. And then you would switch it to long, short, short, short. Yeah, and then you would switch it to short, 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 long. I feel like this is the Beethoven fifth one. Ba 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 ba. But. Yeah, exactly. And then you could take it back to the original um, rhythm. That's beautiful. It sounds so great. Um, but I think that this particular um, exercise works really well in difficult passages. I use it in all of my difficult com and not compound meter with, with the four four meter or two four meter passages. But you have to adapt it a little bit when you are in compound meter. I was just working with a student on the Cessant today and we have this thing the one that goes oh where are you Sessa? so you have the this is in six this is in nine and so um instead of you can still do long short long short And you can do short, long, short, long. <laughs> but you can't do long, short, 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 long, short, short, short. It doesn't end correctly. Right. So you could do, instead, you could do long, short, short, long, short, short. Mm. <laughs> and then you can do short, short, long. Can go back to the original passage you know the original um rhythm 
So, so those are some ways that you can vary things and repeat things over and over with, while still keeping them, I think, fresh and, and feeling like it's, I just think it sometimes gets tricky to repeat things the same way over and over if you don't change yeah. things just a little bit so that you don't, so that you're thinking about something else. If, if we start, I don't know if you felt this way before, but when I repeat things over and over, sometimes my mind starts to wander and I stop focusing on the yeah. things that I thought I was originally focusing on. So you could also do the same thing, just changing the articulation. Maybe in the Mozart, you want to just slur it all. Or you want to do, maybe you do tongue tongue slur to. Which just feels weird. <laughs> the emphasis is, yeah. Or tongue one, slur three, and so on and so forth. But it would, sorry, I'm hearing my cat. That's no, okay. <laughs> yowling, yowling, yowling. But hold on, I'm going to let him in because sure, he no will not <laughs> stop until he is heard. All right. I can't be loud in here. So anyway, um, I think just finding different ways to keep the repetition fresh by changing the rhythms, by changing the articulation will help us in our abacus work or however we're going through with the penny game or <laughs> whatever. Sorry about my cat. Okay, um, very happy to be here. <laughs> to be able to um, do that. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So anyway. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Sorry. No, that was super helpful. I'm sure. Yeah, that definitely helps engage the mind into what's actually happening. Um, do you have any advice for uh, young comp composers or young oboists who want to go on and have a career in music? Absolutely. I I really think that just keep on um, believing that you can still do all of those things and finding ways that you can cultivate your your um, interest in all of those areas keep on working on on composition and oboe and and where they meet together because i think there's something really special about the places that those things meet together um and and those places i think provide a, those those people who are interested in those things i think then they can provide a unique musical offering and and i think that the same goes in many different places. We have wonderful oboists who are also really highly trained in Alexander technique and that's something that they're really interested in. And, and they have really unique musical offerings where those, where those two things meet or, or maybe oboists who are also really accomplished at jazz and they have become really fantastic improvisers on the oboe. And so they have given these really unique musical offerings where these two interests meet and, and where they're able to make some really unique offerings there. And so um, learn all you can if, as a composer and an oboist, um, because I think that your oboe, I think all the repertoire that you learn um, not only makes you a better performer, but also will impact your composition, um, your the learning that you do in your composition. I'm frequently thinking of, of the beautiful oboe concertos that I played when, when I, if I'm writing an oboe concerto, I'm thinking about how Martineau made that particular magic in the second movement or, or um, uh, the beautiful second movement melody of a Strauss and how to create a melody like that. Or, or I'm very often thinking of the beautiful orchestra music that I have played before and, and how I felt then and, and how could I um, make somebody feel that way. Um, I think performance is, is super important part of your composition process. When I was writing Four Personalities, the first movement that I wrote was Blue. And I remember up to that point, my favorite piece on the oboe was the Poulenc Oboe Sonata. I was just so moved the first time I heard it in that third movement, that sad, sad third movement that's so beautiful too. And I thought, oh, I wanna, someday I wanna musically figure out how to make somebody feel that way. And I'm still figuring it out because nobody can do it like Poulenc. But, but I had that in the back of my mind when I was writing Blue and, um, and I was, you know, hearing some of the chords and some of the, um, I guess, stylization of, of Poulenc and, and it um, impacted the way that I was thinking about my writing. So I think the more that we learn 
about performance that it can help us in our in our compositional process too and vice versa because whenever i compose i feel like i'm thinking about the harmonies and the music theory behind it mm -hmm. and the music theory is it's really important to study music theory and what's going on theoretically in the music that we study because it informs how we phrase things. And so um, I think that they both really can play hand in hand with making you better at both of them or the best that you personally can be, you know? So, yeah. Wow. That's, that's incredible. Um, last question. Uh, is oboe a great instrument or the greatest instrument? That's very true. <laughs> Not That's so very true. I remember watching a, I remember watching a video. I cannot, oh, I'm going to slaughter it because I don't remember who the video was by, but it was one of these really wonderful oboists who I look up to. And, and he was talking about how you tell the oboe to do this and it says no. And you tell the oboe to do that and it says no. And <laughs> like, it keeps on telling you no. It doesn't always tell you no, not really, but, but, um, but then, but we keep on playing it because we have this magical yes moment, you know, yeah. that, that keeps us going on it. And it's not really that it always says no. I mean, I really do love playing and, mo and I would say 90% of the time I am very happy when I'm playing the oboe and there's definitely a 10% where I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but uh, I, I think the same could go for any instrument too, when you're, you're kind of in the trenches trying to figure out a new technique or, or practicing something that's super hard. So, but I love the oboe and, um, but I, I love, I really love all the instruments. I don't know if you've experienced this before, sitting in the orchestra and hearing the horn play some glorious Mahler melody and being like, I really wish I played the horn right now. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or when the, or when you uh, see a drum set player and they're just like really, you know, I setting the tone so well for the for their combo piece and and the feel is so good and and they're all improvising and, and exchanging with one another. It's one of the things that made me want to take jazz improv classes when I went to CCM because I was just so jealous of their uh, you know the freedom that they experienced when they were improvising and and so I I um, took several semesters of that when I was there and just loved it so much. Um, on oboe, they let me do it on oboe, which I was thrilled about. So, Great. um, but, uh, yeah, I think that all the time when I hear different instruments, I, I'm so glad that I play the oboe when I play certain things. I'm like, Oh my goodness. I'm so glad I play the oboe. But sometimes I'm like, but really right now I wish I played, you know, <laughs> this <laughs> instrument because I think they work together so beautifully to make this composite musical magic that is, you know, symphonic sound and, right. and, or, or jazz sound or a variety of different styles. So, so I love all the instruments. I do really love Bobo though. So. Well, thank you so much. I feel like I learned a ton today. I hope that people watching this interview will, will also come away with uh, some value. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you. Thank you for all that you do for, oboe us all over and keeping us connected. I really appreciate it. Oh, super kind. Um, the next time that you're uh, kind of emerging into the public will be uh, when? Oh, um, well, assuming well, that this ends soon, this whole <laughs> pandemic situation. I have a, I have a couple of like, ob I'm playing at an oboe day. We have it scheduled that I'm going to be playing at an oboe day in Georgia in September, depending, you know, on, yeah. on what's going on. But a lot of these premieres that are happening, happening for Rocco and for, um, and for uh, the Richmond Symphony are happening in, in February, 2021. And I will probably um, try to pair it with some oboe recitals that I give in the area. Cool. Then, cool. and um, hopefully, yeah, so. So yeah. if you can, definitely go check out uh, Adriana Samora. She's a fantastic oboist and, of course, a incredible composer. Um, I don't remember how I kind of got on to your to your website, but I was really uh, into your four personalities for years, and uh, I, I think you. I finally <laughs> heard something else that you had written maybe like a few months ago, and I kind of went down this rabbit hole this year just listening to a bunch of your music, and I thought, you know, it'd be really <laughs> great to to hear what what she thinks about it, you know so thank you so much thank you i appreciate thank you. it thanks so much i hope you have a great 
day and stay well and thanks for the opportunity. Yep. And if you're watching, don't forget to uh, subscribe if you haven't already and hit that like button. Thanks a lot, Osa. We'll see you the next time. Thank you.